Okay, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the GLF Landscapes Forum. I'm here with Musondo Mumba, who's head of uh, UN Environment, head of Terrestrial Ecosystem Unit. Hi. Indeed. How are you? Hi, Natasha. Lovely welcome. to be here. Welcome. So please Great. tell us, what, what is your title, Terrest Head of Terrestrial Ecosystems Unit? What does that involve? Okay, that involves basically uh, providing a coordination role for all things terrestrial within the UN Environment Agency. And what that means is I work with a very uh, good and brilliant and amazing big team that is scattered across the world that focuses on looking at forest elements, forest restoration through a program that we call RED, uh, reducing emissions through um, deforestation and degradation. But also we work on issues that relate to integrated landscapes approach. How do we restore ecosystems and how do we make sure that we have a holistic approach to how we manage ecosystems? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I also understand that you're part of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Indeed. From, from 2030 to 2020 to 2030. Yes. Please tell us more about um, what that's. Well, this UN Decade of Restoration has actually been advocated for by the government of El Salvador and eight other Latin American countries. So what this Decade of Restoration is, is really to mobilize conversation but not just conversation to mobilize action of what we should do in restoring ecosystems I'm sure you may have heard we have way over 600 million hectares of land that are degraded um, and when we look at the African continent in particular where we are 6.6 .6 billion um, hectares of land are degraded so what does that mean that means that we need to get governments to have a conversation they've made commitments but we need real action on the ground so this decade of restoration is really trying to mobilize a concerted effort across um, the uh, southern uh, the southern bit of the, the the continent so mostly latin america africa and asia to really begin to have sort of concrete conversations on how we restore these degraded uh, ecosystems for not just our human well-being but also for biodiversity that very much depend on these ecosystems. Lovely. So what are the main challenges that you're facing in, in, in terms of landscape restoration? What are the main challenges that, are, that you are... Well, some of the main challenges that we are facing, I really, um, you know, th th there are many productive landscapes where our food is grown. And sadly, some of the activities um, of producing food are, are terrible. Um, that means we lose the soil, or the soil becomes terribly polluted. Um, and in some cases, we have forest headwaters that get, uh, that get really degraded to an extent that a river stops flowing. Um, on, this uh, on, the, on the African continent, we've also realized that um, some rivers have just completely dried up. Now, what, that, what does that mean? That means that the communities downstream will no longer have a source of water. Not only will not, they no longer have a source of water, even their lands that are so dependent on a river system or a wetland ecosystem for, uh, for water and for production, um, then what we need is to really now begin to have a dialogue, even at the community level. How do we get people engaged to realize that they are the change they want to be and they should be the ones that begin to have this action on the ground to restore the ecosystems where they live. So some of the challenges, as I mentioned, are issues that we look at degradation in, in the sense of productive landscape systems. We also look at deforestation, which is a huge issue. Case in point is the Mao Forest, just here in Kenya, where we've witnessed huge amounts of deforestation that have implications for way beyond the borders of Kenya. Right, mm. wow. Um, Okay, so we talked about the challenges, mm -hmm. and I know you've been working in, you know, with UN Environment for a while. So, have, have you, are there any success stories? Because uh, there is awareness now; mm -hmm. people are aware that we've done, you know, done a mess to our planet. So, mm -hmm. have you, are, you, are there any success stories or changes that you've seen that are positive? That absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, Natasha. I think um, for us as an as, as an environmental agency, what we've been trying to do, we we are mandated under the United Nations uh, under the United Nations to make sure that you know issues of environment are publicized within um, communities, but not just at the community level, but also at the political level. So we have the UN uh, Environment Assembly, for example, that brings together 192 countries. And this UN Environment Assembly, the government and the government representatives at the ministerial and presidential level then reflect on the policies that they have at the country level. Case in point, um, this year we had uh, the UN Environment Assembly in March, whose theme was beat pollution. Mm -hmm. In beating pollution, it was so important that governments were on board, and it was really momentous because Kenya, as a government, had banned plastics mm. last year in August. So pollution just doesn't affect 
what we see in the sea or what we see in the river. Pollution also affects the land. Um, I'll give you a classic example. Uh, in places like Isiolo that are predominantly pastoral ecosystems, mm -hmm. it's incredible. I mean, I, I drove there many years ago and everywhere you just see plastics flying in the landscapes. And not only are they flying, they're being eaten by cows. Wow. So what we've done as UN Environment, one of the successes is to mobilize this conversation to get governments talking and also governments talking to each other. And I think what Kenya has done very well and Rwanda that spearheaded the plastic ban across the African continent is to share their experiences and make sure that a policy is not just a policy on paper, mm -hmm. it's enforceable. You know, how do you enforce that? And how do you phase out the single use of plastics that are found in forest ecosystems, that are found in river ecosystems, that have implications for your health and that of your children and um, that of young people? And, and, and more recently, um, we've also been working with quite a number of governments, uh, not just African governments, but governments across India, governments across China, to look at this whole issue of beating pollution. How do we beat pollution? I mean, we've seen pictures of China, you know, with people with masks mm -hmm. and all this breathing. A study came out yesterday from Yale. Right. So yeah. they were dumber, right? Actually, yeah, they were actually be <laughs> if you can put it that way, yeah, if you can yeah. put it that way. But no, but think about it. Okay. If Africa is going to go in that direction of having high levels of pollution, people will be wondering, why does my child have low grades? Right. And yet you forget that the ambient environment has implications on your health on your state of mind, uh, on your IQ. Right. So already we can see these connections um, at the environmental level. So we have some uh, successes and, and really it's, it's, it's an opportune time. Great. So um, just about the landscapes forum, I guess mm -hmm. to wrap it up, why, why do you think that you know, having such a forum is important in order to get you know, things moving? Or does it? I think it's fantastic. I mean, this is the first Global Landscapes Forum here in Nairobi. Um, we're bringing together about 800 people, which is just incredible. And most of these, in fact, 95% of these people who are coming are from af across the African continent. Mm -hmm. These are people coming from the community level. These are indigenous communities. These are policy makers. These, are, these individuals are scientists mm -hmm. in their own right. And they've done incredible science. But then the question comes again, how is it that we're still living in, you know, in bowls of dust? integrated spaces. So I think this is an opportunity to have a collective conversation and also identify these very strategic opportunities of what is it that we can do and what is it that you and I can do to be part of that change so that we can have you know, environments where uh, our children uh, do not blame us for you know, degraded spaces or not even have a, having seen a tree. In some places, trees have totally disappeared. So I think it's 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 a great it's a great time for Africa, and we're very very excited. And um, I mean, just on the corridors and listening to people, I can see a lot of excitement, and and people are really looking forward to the two days. Yes, yes. So excited yes. to be here. Lovely, and we're very happy that you're here with us. Great. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add that you think is important? Any message you have for the world, for children, for the leaders in the world um, to end our wrap it up? I think the message I have is that we have to remember that we are um, our children are the future so we have to leave the children a planet and a continent that is intact and not just intact uh, 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 an environment that provides the services it's supposed to provide for our survival but then again we share this planet with other species um, I'm sure you know you guys came through Nairobi National Park or Karura Forest uh, the bird life here is amazing I mean smack in the middle of a city right. so we have to think that even within city environments because most of Africa will be urbanized in the next 20 years predominantly urbanized so how do we make sure that even our cities are you know environmentally secure environmentally stable and also providing the services that they need to provide for humanity. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much.